press record, record. And um, Isaiah's here. He's like my right hand man. You want to stick your mug in the, and I just am so grateful to have him here. I'll, he'll put his face in because I talk about him a lot. That's Isaiah. He keeps everything together. All my YouTubes, my news, everything, everything is handles all the technology, which I so appreciate. Anyway, welcome everyone. Welcome to my Somatic Movement and Anatomy series 2021. So this year I'm combining much more anatomy or more anatomy and somatic movement, which are my two loves. Um, maybe I said it, I'm Susan Koenig and today is May 1st, May Day, 2021. And this class is class two of the lower extremity, basically, the legs, but um, we're going to be focusing, uh, well, the somatic center in the center of the body is always involved, but the pelvis, the hip, the thighs, the knees, and maybe we'll get to four legs and feet. I kind of doubt it. So we will actually go into a third class for lower extremities where we can co cover four legs and feet more thoroughly. And uh, that class will also involve some integration on what we've done so far in upper and lower extremities, some, some nice integrative movements. Um, uh, our goals are to apply our anatomical understanding of the lower extremity to improve our understanding and movement of the lower extremity with efficiency and greater ease, to release discomfort and pain, to increase flexibility and strength, and to increase the awareness of our soma. In Thomas Hanna, Thomas Hanna, use the word soma in the original Greek, which means the internal body as you experience your whole being every moment of, the, of your life. And so it's an internal experiencing of your life. It's not just body. And um, I, I love that. And because really when we respond, we are responding as a whole person. And some of our movement will be pendicular using the motor cortex, which means that the motor cortex basically resets your relationship between your brain and your muscles so that you have a lower resting tonus, you have less held contraction. And the pen, when we're doing something pendicularly, I will guide that. We're making a contraction of certain muscles and then we're slowly decontracting to our new neutral so that we increase our resting length. Some of our movements will turn more into a slow flow because it's just very natural and that's what we're going to do. Please follow somatic guidelines, uh, which are move in comfort. This is a skill you have to learn because most of us have over efforted all our life. And in this work, there's no forcing. And in fact, you have to check yourself, am I really comfortable? And uh, so we need to learn to modulate how we do our movement in, in the direction of increased ease, back away from pain and follow any medical directives you've been given. Uh, for props today, there are usual props. You'll have a floor mat, uh, pillows. You may need some extra pillows because at a certain point, we're going to externally rotate both our legs at the same time. And sometimes it's nice to have one or two or quite fluffy pillows under the outside of both thighs at the same time. And then some people like some support for their head. And some people, instead of just their legs straight, like a pillow or bolster under their knees. We'll be doing some palpation as we look at pictures. We're gonna start with anatomical pictures like we've been doing. We'll do some palpation. That helps you find uh, and locate in space uh, bones, bony parts, uh, muscles. And uh, by palpating, you also get a feel for what are tight contracted uh, muscles versus what are muscles that are more relaxed and spongy and pliable. And uh, 
when we lie on the floor, if you want me to be able to see you, I can only see a certain amount of people at a time, but that's okay. If when you set up your device, if you can see your floor mat in your screen, then I can see you because you'll be on your floor mat. So that's a, a good little trick to use. Okay, I have a note all over the place check to make sure record is on and it is. So we are going to now start and I am going to go to screen share. Whoops. All right, let me change this. Let me do this. Let me do this. There we go. Okay. And uh, this has been our, our, our first slide for a number of classes. I, I've altered it a little bit because today is class two, pelvis and lower limb. And we will see how far we get. We'll get to hip, thigh, knee, and maybe next class might be four leg, ankle, foot, and toes. And so the next class will be on June 5th. We've seen this slide before. I always do very teeny little variations on it. Our limbs, I'm reading up here, our limbs, which are our extremities, which are our arms and our legs, need the support and control of the spine and trunk. The spine and the trunk is this rectangle. It includes the hips and the shoulder joints. And uh, we need the support of our spine and trunk to move our extremities with ease and efficiency. And um, we've had a class where we divided the trunk, which is what I like to do in terms of the rib case, the somatic center. And of course, this is three-dimensional front, back, and sides, the somatic center and the pelvis. And again, it's nice to just kind of glance at these pictures because we, the brain organizes us as a whole. And for us to use our lower extremities or our upper extremities or our head and neck, or we need the support of our spine and trunk. We need to be able to move fluidly. We need things to be, to work synergistically and in coordination. We're going to start with um, what is hip hiking and what is lateral flexion and are they the same? Are they different? Are they interchangeable? And here's my two cents um, on, on hip hiking and lateral flexion. The quadratus lumborum in the next slide, I'll just show you, we're gonna go in and look at the quadratus lumborum, but in this slide, the QL, the quadratus lumborum is known as the hip hiker. Well, what's the difference with that? The obliques are known to be the reference muscle more for what they call full lateral flexion. So we're gonna just look at some possible differences. This picture is from Hoppenfeld. And here's a picture of the book. I love this book, an oldie but goodie. Hoppenfeld was a surgeon and his book, if you ever want a book to help you locate uh, where you are in your body, this is great. It's very readable if you're in the field. So this middle line is your, if you're, if you were standing balanced, this would be the top of your pelvis, the middle line. And in the walking in gait, the, the, the leg that takes the weight, so here's a leg that is taking the weight, that hip goes up and your other hip goes down. And Hoppenfeld, according to Hoppenfeld, the leg that takes the weight, that hip goes up about an inch as an average. And the opposite leg, the hip that goes down, goes down about an inch. So there's about a two inch differential in hip hiking as you walk. So here's a picture that is showing um, what I consider a little bit more hip hiking and why is this hip hiking versus lateral flexion? And, and they're used interchangeably. So it may, this might be a little nitpicky, but you can see her, the upper body is fairly stable. Now the spine is going to 
on the side where the hip is higher, the spine is going to have to have a little bit of lateral curvature, and there's going to be a little fluidity in the upper body. But hip hiking is with the quadratus is done closer to your midline. And so there's less lateral movement from side to side. So here we have a runner and um, you, this is her support leg. This hip is higher, this hip is lower. She's, she's running rather than walking, but you see the shoulder is lower. This shoulder's a little higher. And she has some quote lateral flexion hip hiking. You can see she's a little bit more natural than this picture. Her head is quite centered, although her weight is clearly over this side. And, um, and so is this hip hiking, is this lateral flexion? It's a little of both, using both uh, um, quadratus lumborum and obliques. This woman is standing around, here's her support leg. This hip is higher, this hip is lower, the top of the pelvis at the iliac crest. That's what I mean by hip, it's really the top of the pelvic bones, the iliac crest. And if this is the support leg and this hip is coming up, this hip has to come down. So this leg has to bend because the foot can't go through the cement, can't go through the earth. And she's kind of posing. She's got um, a shoulder strap on. This is probably her lower shoulder. You can see she's got some contraction, a lateral, a lateral movement in her spine, a lateral uh, form in her spine, shape in her spine. Uh, this woman, this mother, is holding her pretty old toddler or pretty large toddler on her hip. You can see she is quite laterally flexed. She's going to have more lateral flexion in her spine. This hip is probably up here and this hip is way down here. If she becomes chronically, if she habitually chronically carries her child and perhaps multiple children on this same hip, she could develop a functional scoliosis I don't know if what kind of quote lateral curvature this really is in terms of is it a functional scoliosis or is it um, meaning that, that you could actually work yourself out of this, but you can see the hip is higher, the, the iliac crest is higher on this side, lower on this side, the shoulder is lower, the ribs are more contracted here, the ribs have more space here, and you see the lack of horizontal with, with any kind of hip hiking or lateral flexion. The more you are laterally flexed, the more you're going to be using your obliques, as well as I'm sure you're also using your quadratus. The more you're upright but hip, hike a hip, your, your reference muscle is going more towards the quadratus lumborum, and you're probably using your obliques as well. I think this is a kind of a combination of obliques and quadratus. And this comes, um, I'm, I've put uh, the physiology of, of the joints by Kapenji, this book, it's a great book, very dense, very much for somebody in the field. Uh, there's three volumes. Uh, but uh, this is what's used in many universities, labs for understanding and looking up what the physiology of the joints really means. And Thomas Hanna referenced a number of his movements and references with this book. Okay, let's look at the muscles involved. So lateral flexion and hip hiking, both of these have to do with side to side balance. The QL, the uh, quadratus lumborum, as we said, is called the hip hiker. It hikes your hip, meaning it hikes one side of your pelvis. Your obliques attach ribs and pelvis, of course, at the iliac crest and at the ribs. So let's come over here. Here's your external oblique. Here's your internal oblique. This is from Travel. This, this is a, the external oblique is superficial in relationship to other abdominal muscles. And it, it, the upper attachment are the uh, ribs all the way to the fifth rib. 
and along the um, crest of the ilium superficially, and the internal oblique is right underneath the external oblique, and it also attaches to ribs, and it attaches to the external, uh, I mean, to the iliac crest. And this, the obliques are more superficial. The quadratus lumborum, and here is deep in the body. Here's your 12th rib. Here's your iliac crest, the top of the pelvis. This is psoas. We'll maybe talk a little bit about psoas. Here's your spine. Here's the uh, diagonal fibers of quadratus, quadratus in green. Here are the horizontal fibers. It, it attaches 12th rib, 12th rib to iliac crest, and it attaches along the transverse processes of the spine. Because it attaches to the 12th rib, is an, it's an accessory breathing muscle, as is the psoas. And in hip hiking, the top of the uh, iliac crest here in the back, deep in the body. So it really should show this coming and more anterior on the iliac crest, hikes your iliac crest up whoops, <laughs> sorry, up towards your 12th rib. And, and, and because it's very close to your spine, it's a smaller lateral curvature on the side that is tighter or more contracted. Now, we, I want you to get a sense of how, how actually narrow the corridor for the uh, quadratus lumborum is. So, I'm going to come out for a moment and then I'll go back to screen share. And you don't have to stand up. You can come along with me if you want. But in the back, um, am I in the picture? Um, yeah. I'm in the picture. Okay. So here's my here's my spine. Here's my twelfth rib. Some people their twelfth rib is so buried. Um, make a chat if you can't hear me when I turn around. Because my, uh, on many people, this 12th rib is so buried, you can't even feel it. Uh, but here's the 12th rib, and here's the top of my iliac crest. Now, if I put my fingers on my spine, and I come out about two inches, possibly three inches if you're a larger person, that's the corridor from the spine approximately out two at the most three inches through your lumbar area, through the low back in the back. That's just how narrow the quadratus lumborum is. And a hip hiking is when, a hip hiking, I know you can't really see, is when I'm bringing my, the top of my iliac crest up up to my 12th rib. Now my obliques attach way out here, all a lot of ribs to the top of my iliac crest. And so as I laterally flex, this hip comes up, my armpit comes down, my ribs squeeze. I have a much bigger lateral curvature with lateral flexion with the obliques than I do with the quadratus. And usually my head follows. If I'm on the floor, it'll roll. And so this larger, and you can palpate these muscles. If you, if you bring your hip up and your armpit down and your ribs squeeze, you can feel how contracted your muscle, your obliques are together, very contracted. And your awareness is brought more laterally. When you're hip hiking and you stay narrow, remember the quadratus is deep and it's two or three inches from your midline on me, it's probably two inches or less, because um, I'm small. Uh, when I bring that hip up, I get some lateral movement, but my upper body is not as curved as it is with a more full lateral flexion. And my awareness of the movement is closer in to my spine. And maybe you'll feel that as well. Let me go back to screen share. So <clears throat> yes, we use them interchangeably, but 
when your reference muscle is more oblique, you've got a larger lateral curvature. When your reference muscle is the quadratus, you have a, a, a more upright posture, although there's a little bit of lateral curvature. In my opinion, that's the difference. Now, other muscles play a role as you're doing gait in stability and side to side stability. Gluteus medius, Thomas Hanna loved the gluteus medius. I'll talk about it in a little while, a little bit more. But muscles, side to side movement depends on a synergy, a symphony of a lot of muscles. It also includes uh, side to side um, balance with the psoas and probably as well with the iliacus. Okay, let me come down to, so an, another movement, so we're gonna focus, we're gonna focus today on um, uh, uh, um, uh, lateral flexion and, whoops, sorry, lateral flexion and uh, done with the quadratus and done with the obliques uh, in supine on the floor this morning. I just wanna mention, um, and maybe you can hold, some of you can hold this picture. At the very end of class, I'm going to do a movement uh, taught to me by Bill Keel, who's actually in this class, and it involves the psoas and the iliacus. Now, both the iliacus and the psoas are called hip flexors, and they attach down onto the lesser trochanter. This is the femur bone in your thigh. This is, yeah, your femur. Here's your lesser trochanter. The big bump on the outside is your greater trochanter. But the psoas is much more narrow. The psoas is much more narrow. The iliacus covers the whole inside bowl of the pelvis. So when you are doing a flatten, in, of arch and flatten, and your pubic bone is coming up towards your ribs, you're very, you're getting the whole bowl of the iliacus, probably also along with some psoas and also with abdominal muscles. Okay, we're going to also be doing some hip internal and external rotation. So when you're lying on the floor and you roll external rotation, remember this is coming from the hip joint. It's coming from the hip joint. And when you roll your leg out, external rotation, the knees go out, the foot goes out to some degree. When you're doing internal rotation, the thigh goes in, the leg goes in, the knee goes in, the toes tend to go in if your leg is straight. Now here's internal rotation. Here's a somatic educator helping a client understand how to do it. We're gonna do it on our own, but again, here the knee is bent but the movement is coming from the hip. The movement is coming from the hip. Internal rotation, thigh and knees in, thigh and knees in. Here's external rotation. Many of us can do a, a larger external rotation, but your thigh and knee are out. Your thigh and knee go outward. And here in the sitting position, we've got um, on the sitting twist movement in the daily cat routine, this is external rotation. Thigh externally rotated from the hip, knee out, internal rotation, thigh internally rotated, rotated from the hip, knee is in. And where do your internal and external rotators come from? External rotators are in the, your butt cheek. So here's the big gluteus maximus. We're taking that off. Here's gluteus medius. Here's piriformis. Here are some other smaller but important external hip rotators. Here they've cut the gluteus maximus. A side view. Side views are really nice. Gluteus medius. And uh, here's gluteus medius again. It's a very side muscle. Here's the front. Here's your pubic bone. Here's your tailbone. Here's the side of your body. Uh, the um, gluteus medius and gluteus minimus are abductors, they bring your leg outward from your hip, but they also have a rotational function. If you consult Compendi, and this is what Thomas Hanna consulted, the majority of the fibers of gluteus medius uh, for the rotational function work for external rotation. The majority of the fibers of gluteus minimus 
work for internal rotation at the hip. And the gluteus minimus, whether you can see it or not, maybe it's not really well illustrated, it attaches to the greater trochanter more anteriorly, whereas the gluteus medius attaches most, more posteriorly. Thus, Tom liked to say, gluteus medius categorize them, yes, abduction, but with external rotation, Gluteus minimus, yes, it's an abductor of the hip, but uh, put it more with internal rotation of the hip. Just another picture, gluteus medius, gluteus minimus, the famous piriformis, famous because of sciatic nerve problems. And here are adductors. Your external rotators usually, but not always, work with the abductors. So your external rotators, here's gluteus medius, gluteus minimus, gluteus medius, gluteus minimus. Gluteus, media, um, gluteus medius works more with the external rotators for external rotation. The internal rotators like gluteus minimus work with the adductors on the inside of the thigh and adduction and internal rotation usually, but not always go together and abduction and external rotation tend to go together. Um, as the class goes on, we are going to work with the quadricep muscles on the front of the thigh and the hamstring muscles on the back of the thigh. There are four quads. We have vastus medialis, vastus lateralis, now the more superficial quad is rectus femoris. It's a two joint muscle. It works to extend the knee with all the other quads together. All four quads extend or straighten the knee, but the rectus femoris flexes the hip. So it also, it also flexes the hip. Under the rectus femoris is the vastus intermedius and it does not cross the hip joint. And then for the hamstrings, there's three of them. The medial, and we're going to work with medial quads, lateral quads. We're also going to work with rectus femoris. We're going to work with lateral hamstrings, the, quadra, uh, the um, biceps femoris, but it has two heads. You can't see that here. And the medial hamstrings, there are two of them, semimembranosus, semitendinosus. We're going to also work with medial and lateral hamstrings. And here you see it, this person is, is running, but you see quads, hamstrings work synergistically together. The rectus femoris, one of the quads flexes the hip, all quads extend the knee. This, this leg is coming into knee or straightened position. The hamstrings as a group extend the hip, meaning the leg goes behind you and the hamstrings bend the knee. Now, uh, one more thing. I, I don't know if we're going to get into four legs, but let me just uh, show a picture in case we do. We're going to be working in the supine position with our feet flat. Um, when the, with the knee bent, you can rotate the foreleg into external rotation, and you can rotate the foreleg and foot, foreleg and foot, into internal rotation. So here's a picture in sitting. It's a wonderful position to work with. You want to keep your feet as flat as possible. This is internal rotation of the foreleg and foot. This is, um, usually it's girls, and this is extreme foreleg external rotation, but the thighs are internally rotated. If this becomes habituated as this person grows up, she's going to have an internally rotated up, up thigh and an externally rotated foreleg. And she is going to have a very skewed balance between the upper leg and the lower leg. But what controls the rotation of the foreleg are the hamstrings, because this is the lateral hamstrings. They come down below the knee, just like the medial hamstrings come down below the knee. So external rotation, the main reference muscle is are the lateral hamstrings, biceps femoris, the reference muscle for internal rotation of the foreleg are the medial 
hamstrings. And that's as far as I'm gonna go today. So thank you. Let's go ahead and um, position yourself on the floor, get your pillows together, get support for under your head if you like that, get support for the outside of both thighs. And just start to make yourself comfortable, start to breathe. I'm gonna give people just a little bit more time. And one of the things I like to do with breathing is put one hand on my chest, kind of on my upper chest, one hand on my lower belly below my navel. And just, you don't have to make your breathing big, but just feel if you're doing, if you're breathing both into the belly and up into the rib cage and all parts of your chest. And if you're not, see if you can coax your breathing into belly and chest very gently. It's nice to feel the effect of your breathing. Sometimes you learn an awfully lot by putting your hands on yourself, your legs can be straight or bent. Your breathing will probably be a little bigger if your knees are bent, but, they're, but you have to breathe in both positions. So just take a position of comfort. But now if your uh, legs are straight, go ahead and bend your legs. You can bring your hands down or not and let your breathing take you into arch and flatten. Let your in, and this will be easier with your knees bent. As you inhale, let your inhale take you into a gentle arch. You're rolling your pelvis towards your tailbone. Your lower back is lifting a little bit. As you exhale, you're letting go of the back. You're gently contracting your belly muscles and your pubic bone is coming more towards your chest. And that goes with the exhale. So as you inhale, let your inhale gently coax you into an arch and let your exhale gently coax you into a flatten. Go for ease, go for not forcing. You can do a very small movement and completely use your inner sensation to feel what is happening. And it can be very releasing, especially to the low back and pelvis to go small. All parts of your back, not just your low back. And let the movement of the arch and flatten help to start to help to move your head and neck. Just let your head and neck, let that movement come up through your spine, however your head and neck wants to move. Relax your jaw. And here's a great thing to do. As you arch and flatten, do an experiment and don't hurt yourself, but clench your jaw and notice the effect it has on your arch and flatten. And then unclench your jaw and see if you don't feel a greater flow and freedom through your trunk, through your spine, through your rib cage, through your pelvis, through your head and neck. So when you catch yourself clenching your jaw, the, the, the clenching of the jaw hampers movement in general. And come to rest on, after a flatten, come to rest. And we're going to um, integrate pelvic and low back movement with the pelvic clock, just a very, um, minimal, um, not a lot of variation on the pelvic, pelvic clock. We're basically going to be doing circles. It's such a way to integrate a number of movements to get your body flowing. So go ahead and bend your knees if you straighten them. And as you inhale and arch, going towards your tailbone is six o'clock. 
And as you exhale and you come into your waistline and above in your lower back, that's 12 o'clock. And then rotate. You're gonna find, you're gonna do your own, which side is, which butt cheek is your three and which butt cheek is your nine. So you're gonna rotate your weight into the butt cheek that is your three and your other butt cheek will lighten a little bit. It doesn't matter your knee, your knees and legs may move and then rotate your weight into your butt cheek that represents nine. Your other, uh, your other hemi pelvis will, will lighten or rise a little bit and just gently go a little bit from three to nine. It's a rotation. Let your body just flow with the movement. And now begin to do a circle of the circumference of the clock. Inhaling, going to six, coming around. I like to start on, I'm a green light person. I like to start on a six and uh, I like to come around. It doesn't matter which direction you go, either to the three or the nine. When you get to the 12, you're in a flatten. Now, as you start going and making your circle towards either your three or your nine, when you get to your six, you're in an arch. And now you start letting go of your arch gradually, coming into your flatten gradually. When you're at the 12, you're in your flatten. So gently make a circle with your pelvis. It can be a small circle, it can be a big circle, it can be medium. Relax your face and jaw, go in the other direction. Often we start in the direction that is our direction of ease. There's a lot of different movements we've habituated unconsciously and we don't even realize. Choosing a side to work with is usually um, the side of ease because those muscles are habituated to go that way. Some of those muscles are already contracted that way. That's why you go that way. And one more time, change the circle, you can even spiral, spiral inward, getting smaller and smaller to a point, and then spiral outward, a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger, but always to comfort and spiral, whether you're in or out now in the opposite direction, spiraling in and out. Freedom in the jaw is more freedom in the whole body, as often, especially in the pelvis. And come to rest. Okay. Take a little somatic relaxation. It's just an interlude so that you can notice the sensations from the movements you've been doing. And now, Go ahead and bend your knees again. I usually bend my knees one at a time. And with, let's start with the right. We're gonna work with lateral flexion. We're gonna work with the obliques. Your right obliques are, are on the side of your body between the top of your uh, iliac crest, the top of the pelvis, and, and the meat of the muscle is um, to the lower ribs, although the obliques go up into your ribs. And you wanna palpate with your fingers, um, you're feeling for how much space is between the top of your pelvis and the lower ribs and for density or springiness. So feel your right obliques. And what I like to do is uh, bring your hand down now. We're going to do the lateral flexion, but while you're in the contraction of lateral flexion, I'm going to have you palpate the obliques again, but sometimes with your hand in your obliques, it hampers the movement a little bit. So relax that arm. And now you're going to hike that right hip, bring your right armpit down, let the right rib squeeze. Your head is probably going to roll to the right. Stay within your comfort zone. Hold that and palpate the obliques and feel how much more contracted they've become and more, less space between the top of the pelvis and the rib cage. And slowly let that release. 
and you can let your arm rest. And once again, on the right, and you're equalizing the amount. You're gonna bring your pelvis up, your hip up on the right, as much as you bring your armpit down. Don't overdo the armpit coming down. There, you're equalizing that. The center of that contraction is the obliques. This is pendiculation. And feel from the inside, you're very lateral. When you do a larger lateral flexion, you're lateral in your awareness. You're right in those obliques. And slowly, part two of pendiculation is to slowly come out, decontract to your new neutral, to your new resting length. And relax. Let's take our left hand and palpate the obliques on the left. Feel the top of your iliac crest. You may even notice which hip is higher because often we have a higher lower hip. And the bottom of your rib cage, feel the tissue, the muscle tissue for its tautness or springiness. Let that arm relax. And now you're gonna hip, you're gonna, sorry, laterally flex left. Your hip comes up, your armpit comes down, your spine is curving. So the inside of the curve is to the left. Your left ribs are contracted. Your head is probably rolling left and feel how tight your obliques got. Your obliques got more contracted. And now slowly release. As you release, feel the difference in the tissues and then let your arm relax. And now with your arm relaxed, although you have choice here, go ahead, laterally flex to your left, hip up, armpit down, ribs gently squeeze, head probably rolls. And, and internally feel how lateral you are, feel how much you're in your obliques. If you really focus on obliques, ribs to, um, lifting the uh, hiking the uh, lifting up the pelvis you're laterally more lateral in your awareness and slowly come out of that yes your quadratus lumborum probably played a role but now let's go more to a quadratus lumborum per, uh, uh, perspective so this is best done with your legs long so that you're more in the walking with your legs underneath you so you're more in a walking position with your legs long. If that is not comfortable, you can bend your non-working leg and work your working leg, let your working leg be long. Okay, now bring your awareness close to your spine from your spine to about two inches lateral of your spine in your back, just use your low back. And what you're going to do, you're still gonna relax your upper body, but what you're going to do is you're gonna keep your focus uh, in that, in the lumbar spine, it, about a two inch corridor, and just gently hike that hip, bring the back of your pelvis up towards your 12th rib, and slowly let that release. Bring your awareness more into quadratus lumborum. It's actually a very deep muscle and it's bringing your pelvic crest in the back up towards your 12th rib. There's gonna be some lateral flexion in your, in your spine, but you're not gonna do as much lateral movement. Your head is gonna move a little maybe, but not as much. And, and as you contract and slowly release, that's more a quadratus lumborum focused hip hiking. Are you using your obliques? Probably a little bit, or some of you probably are, but your reference muscle is more quadratus. Come out of the one that you're on and go to your opposite. Before you start, you, you can even, in your mind's eye, you're gonna go to your other side, the whole lumbar area, lumbar one through five, from your spine to about two inches out laterally from your spine. And you're bringing your pelvic uh, crest in that area, your iliac crest up towards your 12th rib and slowly release. You are not intentionally bringing your armpit down. It may happen a little bit, but it's more you're hiking that um, iliac crest in the back up towards your 12th rib 
letting the rest of your body organize, it'll be a smaller movement than a full lateral flexion. Even though there is some lateral movement, you can't help but have some lateral movement if you're hiking one hip or the other. And now begin to alternate if you can. Now, if your back is a little sore, you can do it with your knees bent. That's fine. The reason I like to start with the legs long is people usually make the movement a little smaller and then they can really feel the quadratus a little bit more. But certainly you can do it with your legs straight or your legs bent and you're getting the more up and down fibers. Well, how do you get the diagonal fibers? All you do to get the diagonal fibers is abduct your legs a little bit, move your feet out. If your legs are long, move your legs out a little bit. If your knees are bent, move your knees and feet out a little bit. You still have a narrow focus, but now you're hip hiking. It may grow it a little bit. It may grow it a little bit, but with your legs more abducted you're, and you're do, focused on hip hiking, you're getting more of the diagonal fibers of the quadratus lumborum. And you can alternate from side to side slowly, back away from pain. Your legs can be long or bent. And now, just as an experiment, see if you can grow that movement where your focus is both quadratus and obliques. And notice when you add the obliques to the quadratus, your movement is probably going to grow a bit, become a little bit more lateral. And I usually do it in a, a slow flow and alternation from side to side. Keep your jaw relaxed. and come to rest in any position that is comfortable. And turn over into the prone position, do the best you can. If you don't lie on your belly well, one, you can just um, visualize it, but two, if you put your bed pillow under uh, kind of the center of your belly, where your, your navel is the center of the pillow, it can often is way easier for people to be able to lie prone. And then one, I usually put one hand over the other, my forehead on my back of my hands. Um, so you want to try to make yourself comfortable, but it's okay to not do this move. So we are in prone and go ahead and do some hip hiking slash lateral flexion, just alternate one side. And it's up to you how narrow you wanna make it more hip hiking or how large you wanna make it more towards lateral flexion. If it's a larger movement, your armpit is coming down a little bit. If you're making it a narrow, more, more, more quadratus lumborum movement, you're not really programming your armpit to come down. It may happen, but you're not intentionally doing it. That's just a warm up. Okay, come to rest. We're going to be working with our hamstrings, the back of our thigh. The hamstrings bring your leg backward and they also bend your knee. We are gonna do two repetitions do small movements so you don't get any cramping. You're going to designate, uh, let's start with the right leg so I don't get mixed up in the directions. And you're going to start with your right leg relatively down straight, neither too internally rotated or too externally rotated. And you're going to slowly bend your right knee. You can bend it a little bit. I suggest bending it not more than 90 degrees. That's quite a lot. And bending of the knee is brought to you by your hamstrings and with your knee bent, organize yourself. You don't have to actually lift your thigh off the floor, but organize yourself as if you were lifting your thigh. It'll already contract the hamstrings way more strongly with the gluteal muscles, your foot, is coming toward the ceiling, but you don't even have to truly lift. And then slowly 
If you've lifted, let your thigh come down. If you haven't lifted, just relax your thigh first and then slowly bring your foot down so that you are coming out of decontracting hamstrings. Now, when I say slowly, you can't go too slowly, although I don't want you to go too fast because there's um, three different positions and we wanna do two repetitions of each, um, of each position. Once again, we're gonna do the same thing. You're going to bend your right knee comfortably, adjust it based on feedback from the last time you did it, organize yourself to lift your thigh that's bringing your hip into extension. You're also contracting your gluteal muscles and you may feel it up into parts of your back. And then slowly relax your thigh, your knee thigh come down or relax first, and then let your foot come down, coming out of knee flexion to relaxation. Now you're going to prepare yourself for working with the lateral hamstrings, the biceps femoris. What you're going to do as you bend your knee, you are going to externally rotate. You're going to roll your thigh outward. Your foot will come inward. Your knee will go out a little bit. So you're bending your knee with external rotation from the hip and then organize yourself to lift or almost lift your thigh off the floor because that will be the um, uh, extension part of the hamstring and then slowly relax first from hip to through thigh and then relax your knee by bringing, letting your foot come back down and organizing your leg comfortably. And we're going to repeat that. See if you can visualize where your lateral hamstrings are. They're the lateral side of your thigh, not the side of the body, but the lateral side of the back of your thigh. So as you bend your knee, you're going to externally rotate your leg, your foot will come up, your knee goes out, your foot goes a little in, and organize yourself to slightly lift your thigh off the floor, but you don't actually have to do it. Then slowly release first your thigh, and then slowly bring your foot down. Let that leg come into a comfortable position. Maybe you could feel those lateral hamstrings maybe, and rest. And now prepare yourself to work with the medial hamstrings. That's the half of your, the back of your thigh that's more medial, not the inside of the thigh, but the medial half of the back of your thigh. So now as you bend your knee, you are going to internally rotate your a leg, your knee comes, uh, your knee comes in, your foot goes out, and you've done the flexion part of the knee. Hamstrings now, now organize yourself to lift or slightly lift. See if you can feel those medial hamstrings. Slowly relax first through the thigh, decontract first through the thigh, and then slowly bring your foot down to relax through the foot, through the rest of the leg. And you're going to repeat. As you bend your knee, you're going to immediately rotate your leg, your knee comes in, your foot goes out. Organize yourself to lift or almost lift your thigh off the floor. Slowly release your thigh. Slowly bring your foot down. Let that relax. You can make the movement very, very small. This is a pretty strong hamstring movement because you're working both the knee function and the hip extension function. Okay, let's go to your left leg or your other leg. Middle position. So your leg is pretty much under you. You're going to go ahead, bend your knee, flexion of the knee hamstrings and now organize yourself to lift a little bit extension of the hip you don't actually have to lift 
Slowly first, bring your knee down to relax your thigh, then slowly bring your foot down to release all the rest of the hamstrings. And we'll repeat one more time. Go ahead and bend your knee, adjust from based on your response from before, organize yourself to lift or almost lift for the extension function of your hamstrings. Slowly release the thigh back down to the floor and then release the foot. Gonna do exter we're gonna do the lateral hamstrings. So bring your awareness into the lateral side of the back of your thigh. As you bend your knee, you are going to externally rotate your leg as you bend your knee, your knee out, your foot in a little bit and organize yourself to lift or barely, just the organization of it will contract those um, medial hamstrings and slowly release. Wait, we're on, I'm sorry, lateral hamstrings. Oh, sorry, you're in lateral, lateral rotation. Slowly bring your uh, knee down, slowly bring your foot down. That was hopefully lateral, the lateral hamstrings. Once again, lateral hamstrings. As you bend your knee, laterally rotate your leg, knee out, foot in, and organize yourself to lift or almost lift your uh, thigh in hip extension. Slowly organize yourself to bring your knee down to relax your thigh, and then slowly bring your foot down coming, decontracting into greater resting length. And maybe you could feel those lateral hamstrings. Maybe you can still feel the sensations from them. Bring your awareness to your medial hamstrings, the medial half of the back of your thigh. As you bend your knee, you're going to internally rotate your thigh. Your knee comes in, your foot goes out. You're going to barely lift or organize to lift your thigh into extension of the hip slowly. Release the thigh down and then slowly bring your foot down to release the rest of the hamstrings. One more time. As you bend your knee, you're going to internally rotate your leg. You're going to um, your knee in, your foot out. Organize yourself to lift or barely lift your hamstring, your medial hamstrings. Slowly come down and relax. You need to wiggle your pelvis a little bit or do a little bit of hip hiking because this is what we're going to do. This is all we're going to do in the prone position today and go ahead and turn over onto your back. Okay, rest for a moment. After we've done work in the prone position, we'd like to do some version of an arch and curl. So we're, that's what we're going to do. We're gonna combine the bold, bowed legs and knocked knees portion of one of our daily cat movements with arch and curl. And I will take you through this. So lying on your back, bring your hands behind your head. Remember when you curl, you contract your abdominal muscles, your hands help lift your head and your elbows come toward each other on the curl. Okay, start with you, believe it or not, you're gonna start with your legs long. But what you're going to do, so let me help prepare you. As you inhale and arch, you're going to bring your feet toward each other. Your knees are gonna go out and you're going to slide your feet a little towards your body and you'll have a natural arch in your back. So your feet, sort of the bottom of your feet are coming toward each other, your knees are going out, your feet are sliding up towards your body a little bit, you're in an arch. Now, exhale and just relax, bring your legs long, let your head come down, let your arms and elbows relax. 
Now what's gonna happen um, at, on an exhale when you curl, of course on the curl, you'll contract your belly, your hands will help lift your head. But what you're going to do on the curl is you're going to be bringing your knees in as you bet your knees will bend in, your feet will splay out, but you're still gonna come, your legs are still gonna come your feet towards your body. So inhale to exhale and as you exhale, your upper body's gonna curl, your knees are gonna come toward each other, your feet are gonna splay outward, you're still uh, bringing your feet toward your body, you're still flexing your hips some, but your, your back is flat or flatter and you're curling. And then as you continue to breathe, you're going to lengthen your legs and let everything contract. Some of you may already understand how to do this and you can move on at your own pace, but I'm gonna go through this for those of us that need to go through the instructions again. Legs long, as you inhale and arch, your knees come out, your feet come closer together, the bottoms of your feet come closer together, your knees bend out, slide your feet up towards your groin, you have a natural arch in, you're already arching because you're combining it with upper body arch. And then exhale, slowly release, release your upper body, release the legs long. Knocked knees. Inhale to exhale, contract belly, come into the upper body curl. As you bend your knees, your knees come together, your feet splay outward, you're still traveling up towards your body. Your back is flat, you're in a curl, knocked knees, thighs together, knees together, or in that direction. Slowly release, or continue to breathe, as is comfortable letting your legs come long. We're going to do that one more time. Inhale, arch, knees come out, feet come closer together, feet travel towards your groin. You have an arch in your back. You're in external rotation with both legs. Slowly continue to breathe, probably an exhale and release your legs long. And curl with knock knees, inhale to exhale. As you exhale, head rise, belly contracts, head comes up, elbows come toward each other. As you bend your knees, your knees come toward each other, your feet splay out, your, the insides of your thighs and your knees are coming closer together or maybe touching. You're still traveling towards your body. And then continue to breathe, slowly release legs long and rest. We're going to go to the quadricep muscles. Now, anybody having knee hip problems, working with the hamstrings, working with the quads, is you just, it's, you've got to do those movements. You might need to do a simpler version than the one I'm doing today, but um, I've got all levels in my classes. So I hope for some of you it's challenging, and I hope for others you're just staying within your comfort zone. Okay, the quads are the front of your thigh. Remember, there's four of them. You've got medial quad, lateral quad, and intermedial quad, intermedius quad uh, with your rectus femoris. Okay, we're gonna do both functions. Remember the rectus femoris flexes or bends the hip, all the quads together straighten the knee. Now, your non-working leg can be bent if that's more comfortable. Let your working leg be long. All right, now see if you can follow, see if I can give good directions. You're going to take your working leg, you're going to bend that leg at the knee and the hip and slightly lift that leg so you're flexing a little bit more, but not too far, lift your foot off the floor. And with your leg in the air, straighten your knee. You may need to lower your leg. And all your quads are now contracted. Slowly bend your knee, bring your foot back to the floor and straighten your leg. Because of time, we're gonna just do one repetition for each position. All right, now 
believe it or not, you're going to work with your medial quads, but your leg is going to externally rotate, working with medial quad, vastus medialis. So what you're going to do, leg is long, as you bend your knee and your hip, you're going to externally rotate your leg some, not a lot, bend your, uh, flex your hip more by raising your foot, in, and now straighten your leg in the air with your leg externally rotated. See if you can perceive, you can even palpate your medial quad, your vastus lateralis. And slowly bend your knee, bring your foot to the floor and slide your leg long and let your quads recover into more resting length. Okay, now you may want to palpate or at least the upper part, your lateral quads, just to lateral of midline of the top of your thigh. Your leg is long. As you bend your knee, you're going to internally rotate your bent leg a little bit and lift your foot a little bit, flexing your hip even more. And with your leg in the air, you're going to straighten your leg and you may have to lower your leg, feel that lateral quad, vastus lateralis, very contracted. Slowly bend your knee, slowly bring your foot to the floor and lengthen your leg long. Give yourself just a moment to feel the effects of working with the quads. Please adjust your movement to be within your comfort zone. Okay left leg or other leg, whichever is your other leg. Leg is long, your non-working leg can be bent for comfort. So you're gonna work with all your quads together, but particularly the middle quads, rectus femoris for the flexion, always rectus femoris for the flexion, but your vastus intermedius will be the middle part of the quads most contracted, although all your quads probably play a role. You're going to Bend your knee and your hip, pretty much in alignment, straight up and down, kneecap towards ceiling. Bend your knee and your hip, lift your bent leg a little bit so you get more hip flexion in the air, straighten your leg. You may need to lower that leg a little bit. You may not. All your quads are contracted. Slowly bend your knee, bringing your foot to the floor and slide your leg long. So you're undoing in the order that you contracted. Now, you're gonna work with medial, your vastus medialis, medial quad. You might wanna palpate it if you can reach it. As you bend your knee, you're going to externally rotate your leg. As you bend your knee, lift your bent knee a little bit more flexion, rectus femoris, Knee is externally rotated with your leg in the air, straighten your leg. You may need to lower your leg. You are working with your medial quad when you externally rotate your thigh like this. Slowly um, let your bend your knee, uh, relax your knee, bring your foot down and straighten your leg comfortably. Now we're gonna work with the lateral quad, vastus lateralis as the reference muscle. As you bend your knee, you're, you're internally rotating your leg and your knee, knee and hip are flexing. Lift your leg a little bit to flex your hip more with your leg in the air, knee in, foot out. Straighten your knee. You may have to lower your leg for comfort. You're working with your lateral quads, internal rotation of the leg, lateral quad. Slowly uh, flex your knee again so your foot can come towards the floor or let your knee relax so your foot comes to the floor and lengthen your leg long. And give yourself a moment to recoup. And it's time to bring ourselves to our last movement before we get up and walk around a little bit. Um, 
we're going to do an arch and curl on the diagonal uh, taught in the convention this year by Bill Keel. And it works with, uh, we'll do a, a regular, one regular one uh, on our first side. And then I'm going to guide you through um, a way of doing it that works more with the psoas muscle and another one with the iliacus probably works with both, but it includes more of the iliacus. You may need to look up those muscles if you're interested, but um, go ahead and bend your knees. I'm gonna guide this so I don't uh, lose the directions, although you can work with either side first. I'm gonna go with the right hand behind the head. So if you work with your left hand behind your head first, just know the directions will be backward for you. So knees are bent right hand behind your head. Um, you're going to actually start with your left leg long. Your right leg can be bent. I like to bend my leg from the leg long. It makes you have to work a little harder with knee flexors and hip flexors. So left leg long, right hand behind your head. You're going to inhale and arch. And as you arch, you can even press your heel in the back of your leg down. As you exhale and curl, you're going to bend your knee and your hip, lift your bent leg and uh, your upper body is curling so that your right elbow and left knee are coming toward each other. And then bring your foot bent foot down to the floor and let it go long as you relax your upper body. Okay, this time you're going to do the same on the arch. It'll be on the curl that I changed the directions. Although you can externally rotate your leg a little for the arch. Inhale, arch. Your face can either even turn a little right. Your right elbow goes down if that's comfortable. Your left leg is a little externally rotated. Press your heel and back of your leg down on the arch. As you exhale and curl, you're going to leave your knee out and bring your left foot in. And you're going to bring your, you're going to lift your bent left leg, but you're going to bring your right elbow towards the middle of your medial foreleg. You can use your left hand to help you. Your knee and hip are bent. Your foot is in the air if possible. And your right elbow is coming towards the center, middle of the inner left foreleg. And slowly bring your foot down, let your upper body relax. And that's more so as you're getting a narrower focus, you're getting a psoas focus in the hip and let your leg go long. Just to prepare you, I didn't quite prepare you enough. This time when you um, exhale and curl, your knee is gonna bend outward and lift, but you're gonna bring your left medial arch of your foot and your right elbow together, so. Leg long if you want to do it that way. Inhale and arch. As you exhale and curl, you're going to bend your left knee and hip lift, and you're going to direct your right elbow and the medial arch of your left foot toward each other, and that's more iliacus. It's more the full bowl of the pelvis is coming into the curl, and then slowly Bring your foot to the floor and you can lengthen it or not. And we're going to go to, with those three positions to the other side. We'll probably go over a couple of minutes. Okay, left hand behind your head. I'm going to, um, you can start with the left leg long. You can start with the left leg bent if, you're, if that's easier for you, but you have to work a little harder when your leg is long. You're going to inhale and arch and press the back of your leg and your Heel down on the arch, exhale and on the curl. Your upper body rotates so that your left, uh, left elbow and right knee are coming toward each other. This is our regular arch and curl on the diagonal. Let your foot come back down to the floor and lengthen your leg. 
On the arch, you can get a little bit more of a back diagonal if you externally rotate your leg. And as you inhale and arch, your left elbow goes down to the, into the floor a little bit, your face goes to the left, your right leg externally rotates that leg goes into the floor and maybe it's the heel that goes into the floor. As you exhale, you're going to bring your left elbow, exhale, curl, lift your head. You're gonna direct your elbow towards the center of your medial foreleg between the knee and the um, ankle, the medial foreleg of the right leg. And that's more of a psoas curl. Slowly bring your foot back down and your upper body down, bring your leg long. And again, the, the leg still will go into external rotation for the arch if you want to, you don't have to. Inhale, arch, face a little bit left, left elbow down, right leg a little externally rotate and press the back of the leg or the heel down. Slowly release, go into your curl lifting your head, your left elbow is going to come towards the medial arch of your left foot. Your knee is out, M left elbow, right medial arch. And that's more iliacus curl. It's a very full pelvic bowl curl. And slowly bring your foot down. And you can either relax your leg long or you can leave it bent. Relax in any position that is comfortable. Eleanor Criswell Hannah likes to say, just let your body hum with all the sensations from the movement you've been doing. Give yourself that sense of relaxation. Let your breathing be easy. Let your jaw be relaxed, your face muscles relaxed. <clears throat> And I always suggest <clears throat> that when you're ready, you roll to one side and you come up to standing and then walk around a little bit just to feel the effects of the movements you've been doing in standing and walking. I won't do that officially because time is up, but in our next class where we continue with four legs and feet, um, and integration movements, I will leave time for some guided standing and walking. I think I can promise that. I'm definitely including that in my lesson plans for June 5th class. So <clears throat> if you have a little time and want to stay on, I'm going to unmute people, but take a little time when you're ready to come up to walk around a little bit. I call it the la -di da walk. So I am going to, um, I'm going to allow you to unmute yourself now. I think I did that correctly. I am going to shut the recording down.